Hello, uh, my name is Karine. I am Karine Jean Francois. I'm the National Network Coordinator at Girls Action Foundation. And uh, I want you to let me know if you can't hear it properly in the chat box because we will be starting. Um, I am very excited um, to welcome you to today's webinar. Um, the title is No One Can Tell Us Stories But Us Racialized Girls Making Media. Um, and that Sarah Khan, who's a counselor and advocate in the Outburst Young, Young Muslim Women's Project at the Barbara Schlosser Community Clinic in Toronto, will be presenting. Um, we're really happy to have Farah here, and I'm also very happy to see some of the names that I can see in the attendees list. Uh, some people that we know, some people that we don't know. Um, for some of you, maybe you're new to the webinar series or to Girls Action, so I'll do a very brief presentation of what Girls Action is. So, briefly, Girls Action is a national nonprofit that works to empower girls. Um, we're based in Montreal, uh, where we run a local girls program, but we also work with over 300 um, partner organizations um, across the country. We run their own girls program. So, we, like I said, based in Montreal, we have a national scale across territories and the provinces, and we see ourselves as like a network of community partners, um, and, and that way, that means that we provide leadership training, we organize networking events, we do other things that connect girls and young women, um, but really what we do is mostly support organizations that work with girls and young women through our trainings, through our webinars, through our resources, and much more through our national network. In terms of impact, we reach girls and young women, um, and we strongly privilege um, those who are located in remote um, communities. Um, who are part of marginalized communities, um, especially the North. Um, so this webinar was initiated by one of Girls Action's four national um, networking working groups. So we have set up those working groups, and um, there are four of them for programmers working with different populations. So one group works with mostly indigenous girls and young women, one with newcomer immigrant girls and young women, one with racialized girls and young women, and one for programmers who work in rural, northern, or isolated communities. Um, so those groups meet over the phone, sometimes they meet in person, um, and they really are trying to identify trends and gaps in the sector across the country. Um, and the group works together to initiate activities to address these gaps. Um, and actually this webinar was initiated by the racialized, um, for the, the group for people who work with racialized girls and young women. Um, and you can see pictures from last year's in-person meeting by the, for the newcomer group. Um, and this year, actually, the group for people who work with racialized girls and women met in person, um, and it was a really awesome um, experience. Um, and the entire project is funded by the Canadian Women's Foundation, and we're very grateful for their support. Um, so this is part of a webinar series. It's actually, um, so there's some that are coming up. Um, but you can also see some of our past webinars on YouTube. So this webinar will also be, um, is currently being recorded and will be shared on YouTube. So there's one about Les Filles Canada, Problématiques Majeures et Conseils pour les Problèmes qui ont l'impact that was done in French. Um, we will be having the English version of that webinar in early December, so um, stay in touch. Um, also, the Indian solution to the policy problem, developing an indigenous policymaking model to address First Nations health and education disparities. Uh, that was led by Cassandra, also part of one of our working groups. And the last one that we did um, about two weeks ago was Getting Sex Savvy and about building capacity on LGBTQ issues for service providers working with newcomer youth. Um, that was done by two folks who worked at Planned Parenthood to Toronto um, and also available online on YouTube. So I would really invite you to visit them. And if you want to see what other webinars have done in the past, you can always check out our website. That's girlsactionfoundation.ca slash webinars. So you can have more information and register for the upcoming ones. For today's webinar, so I just did my five-minute introduction. Um, Sarah can't do a 30-minute um, presentation. Then we're going to have a schedule around like a question and answer period for 20 minutes. You'll also have the chance to ask your questions throughout the webinar. That way, um, we don't really have your questions throughout and not just at the end. Um, so what I would invite you is that to look at your right of your screen, you will have, you have a chat box and you have a Q&A, so if ever there are any questions for you, um, please, that would be the place to put them, and I will ask them to fire up. You can send them either privately, so only to me, um, and like my, it says Miriam as ID on the, the screen, but that's me, Kahin, so you can send them that way. Um, 
So if you do that, that way we can make sure that those questions are answered. And then there'll be a few closing remarks and, and then a survey um, that we'll do because it's very important for us that we get your feedback um, in terms of like what we're up to and that way you hear more about us. Um, and we get to know if that webinar was useful for you. So for today's webinar, like I said, we're really proud and super happy and excited to have Farah Khan, um, who's a counselor and advocate in the Albert Young Muslim Women's Project at the Barbara Children Covered Clinic, presenting this webinar. No one can tell stories but us, racialized girls making media. Um, and the description, in case you haven't read it, um, call is Geisha girl, sassy black girl sidekick, oppressed Muslima, Latina siren, Pocahontas, racialized girls rarely see accurate portrayals of their lives in mainstream media. We need media created by racialized girls that celebrate the complexity of their lives, their magic, their brilliance. Together, we will explore the ways racialized girls are already creating media, from vines to Tumblr to dances and poetry, to pull to the challenge school calling policies. Throughout this webinar, Farah will share media production strategies used by girls, community organizations, and grassroots movements to create dialogue and explore issues in their life from an anti-racist, feminist approach. Um, and genre to explore media that heals, builds self-love, and gives radical hope for racialized young girls. And in case you don't know Farah, she has spent the past 16 years working to address gender-based violence through counseling, storytelling, and education. She holds a Master of Social Work and supports women who are survivors of violence as a counselor and advocate. Um, she is also an artist and storyteller. Her short films have been exhibited and screened in Canada, the U.S., and the U.K. She is the editor of Artbeat, the IZAT Project, a graphic novella by South Asian young women about resiliency in the face of family violence. Um, and she just, I think, finished her national U.S. tour. Um, and for community works, she's received a number of awards, including Canadian Council of Muslim Women Awards. You can connect with her on Twitter at Farah underscore Cam. And on this note, I will pass the ball to the mic to Farah, and she will be presenting. Farah, it's you. Turn. Hi there. Oh. Oh. Hi. I think I'm. I'm going to get this right. I'm really excited about being here. So hopefully everyone can see my screen, and if you can't, Maram's going to send me a quick text to tell me that you can't, but hopefully you can. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to be talking about No One Can Tell Our Stories But Us, Racialized Girls Making Media. And I'm so excited to be a part of this conversation. Um, when I first was asked to do it, I thought, well, I don't make media. What do I do about this? And then I started thinking about, oh, yeah, I do make media. And I am a part of movements that make media. And actually, a lot of the work that I'm inspired by is media-driven. Um, and so today, I just want to take a moment to recognize that it is the Trans Day of, of Remembrance. And this is a beautiful poster is made by Mika Rosin. And, um, and it says, remember trans power, fight for trans lives. And I think it's really important to remember the days that we are doing our work on and remember that trans women and trans girls are actually a part of the community to which we are working with. And also thinking about Ferguson today. And this is an image of a young woman protesting. And what has been inspiring to me about Ferguson um, for many reasons is just seeing so many young women of color, specifically black women and girls, be on the front lines and being speaking um, out. Sarah? Yep. Yeah? Sorry for interrupting you. You haven't shared your present yet. Oh, I did. No. Oh, twice. It's fine. <laughs> you see it? No. Um, can you share your desktop? I am. Okay. Well, um, I don't know how to do it. Cause I see you guys can... It's Control Alt Delete D, right? I'm doing Control that. Control D. Yep. Control Alt D. Yep. It's working. Thank you so much, Farah. Sorry for the interruption. That's no problem. So since nobody saw that, we'll go back to this. So this is um, a picture from Trans Day of Remembrance, and I just talked about it, but I wanted you to see it because it's so beautiful. And you can actually get it for your organization, and it supports the Audrey Lord Project, which is an amazing project that works with LGBTQ youth, and it'll go for their trans justice program. And of course, this is the image from um, Ferguson that I wanted to show because I think it's absolutely imperative to have conversations around what's happening right now. And today is going to be pretty, I think a lot of days have been really challenging around what's been happening in Ferguson. And so I'm just 
sending out love to that community. So when we talk about girls making media, what inspires me too is when we talk about racialized girls, we also have to recognize that as racialized people, we are settlers on this land. Um, and to recognize that is to really look at some of the media that's been created by Indigenous folks, specifically young women. And this is one young woman named Alexa, and she says, can't respect our existence, ex expect our resistance. And I love this, this image, and I love this poster, and I think media can be so many things. Media can be us making a sign in our bedroom and putting it up on our wall, telling us how beautiful we are. It can be a post and note on our mirror. It can be um, a tweet that we send out. It can be a drawing in our notebook that we show no one. It can be a song that we sing in our head. It can be the song we sing out loud. It can be a dance that we make that no one knows that it's our special Beyonce song, that dance that we make that no one can see, but it's our celebration. It can be something we do publicly. It can be something we can do on our own. What's important about media for me is that we remind ourselves that we matter, that our voices matter, and that we exist, and that we get to shape our own stories. And that's what I'm excited about these conversations. And I'm excited about Alexa, just to say a little bit of Alexa. Alexa Les Paris is a youth facilitator with the Native Sexual Health Network. She's an Anishinaabe Ojibwe from Makwa. Bear Clan and currently resides on Nako Kamigawang Ing, First Nation. She is 18 years old and her Anishinaabe name is Masa Banuikwi, translates to Great Spirit Woman. Alexa works to live her life by the seven grandfather teachings and believes it's important to intertwine these teachings with sex positivity, environmental justice, and harm reduction. And she um, when I think about media making of racialized girls and women and indigenous women and black women, um, I think a lot of times about the fact that um, I was in a workshop a couple of years ago with Adrienne Marie Brown and she was talking about um, science fiction and she is a organizer and artist and writer and a sci-fi creator in Detroit and she said this really beautiful thing. She said, you know, we need to think that we are science fiction to our ancestors, that we are actually in a space right now where we are living the lives that our ancestors didn't know were, was possible, and we are creating changes and ideas. And I think about every time I'm on a panel with a young woman, racialized woman, or indigenous woman, I'm blown away by the world that they are creating within their own art, within their own community, within their own body, because they are actually science fiction to me, because they are living the life that I didn't know was possible and asking the questions that I thought I couldn't ask out loud. And so what I think I think about when I think about girls making media and racialized girls making media is that they are actually building this new world and I'm kind of challenging the limitations and the narrow definitions of what it means to be a racialized girl, what it may, means to be racialized, what it means to be a woman. And so really inspired by that. And I think that goes with the June Jordan piece. And this is an image by Alexa, Alexis Paul Gibbs, who is a black feminist thinker in the South and is brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And she actually does this amazing meditation that you can participate in. So I would look her up if you can. And um, she says, we are the ones we have been waiting for. And breathe that in, right? Let's breathe that in that moment of we are the ones we have been waiting for. And this is a quote by June Jordan. This is an image by Alexis Paul Gibbs. But June Jordan said this in um, her poem for South African women, and it's been used by Obama, it's been used by um, Alice Walker, it's been used by many people, but June Jordan wrote this poem and she said this. And what I love about media is that media is actually, we're not waiting for anyone else because we are the ones we've been waiting for. We are creating the stories. We are asking the questions. We are doing the work to really make this happen. And I think that's what's been really inspiring to me and about this work and inspiring about um, being a part of media creation projects with young racialized women and girls and, and creating that myself. I know that my own healing as a survivor of violence definitely was about making media and not waiting for other people to make it because I didn't see things that was actually asking the questions I wanted to answer. I didn't see things that were um, saying, you know, 
people were, you know, I read books about sur being a survivor that was really based on, you know, in 30 years you can talk about this, or in 30 years this will be the conversation. But I wanted to know what to do now, and I think that's what's really inspiring. So we talk about media. Let's think about our, ourselves and the racialized girls and young women we work with as the ones we've been waiting for, because we hold the answers to the question and the stories that need to be told are the ones that are within our bodies and within our hearts and within our spirits. And so we can look at, like, selfies. People kind of put this thing down on selfies, and, and, you know, they say, oh, girls are taking selfies all the time. But selfies are actually really powerful pieces. And I think Bad Dominica really talked about that on Twitter um, last year when she said, taking time out of my day to admire myself in the midst of constant anti-black misogynist degradation, feminist selfie. And I love this. Because this is the thing. Our media doesn't have to be this six hours long or 30 hours or five years or four months of work, and absolutely that, that media is beautiful, but it can be, our media production can be just creating a picture of ourselves and documenting our beauty, our brilliance, and our genius in all the ways that we find beautiful and genius, not how other people do. And that's what's kind of cool. Like, I no longer think that, you know, when growing up as a young woman in the oh my goodness, 80s and 90s, um, you know, I've never not seen magazines that have pictures of girls like me. You know, I didn't see pictures of young women with facial hair. I didn't see young pictures of women who were the size that I was or the skin color I was. And I remember going, well, where are they? And, you know, what's fantastic about some of the media we see that is readily available, of course, with class expectations because obviously, you know, to have wireless internet and all those pieces, but we are seeing media created by young women. And you know other people, and then sell, and you know, and she keeps on saying, she says, selfies are the only place I see women like me. Unlike whites, I don't have an entire industry made in my image. And and then Sister Outsider says, Doctor, I used to criticize selfies until I understood the radical politics behind them. The fact that POC, fat, femme, queer, etc. And we can see ourselves. And that's the piece of thing about media is how do we actually celebrate ourselves through media? So working with racialized girls, it can be, you know, can we make a selfie wall? What does it look like? And talk about the politics behind it, that there is politics to, and there's magic in actually seeing ourselves be represented. And Miki Kendall says that too. Actually, we, can we talk about what selfies mean to people who never get a chance to see themselves in mainstream media? And there's so much power in seeing ourselves. And we create that media. We are the ones we are waiting for, and we are creating that media. And we also see that there was a lot of conversations happening where young women kind of gathered and made their own media. So this is one example of a group of Asian American women that when there was a whole Asian sidekick conversation happening on Twitter, they were like, well, we do need feminism because we're not your mail order brides, the cure to your yellow fever, your fantasy sex toys, or your subservient housewives. We are strong, independent, and capable Asian American women. And how amazing is to see imagery that reflects back the multitude of differences within our communities and the, and the differences that we can celebrate ourselves. And that's why when we make our media ourselves, we're actually creating space and opportunity for other people to dream of other worlds, for other people to envision, oh, my story does matter because my story is being reflected back to me or parts of my story is. So we open up kind of a space and dialogue. Um, my friend Yuna Lee, who's an amazing uh, graphic artist and um, designer, talks about you know how we can create wormholes between each other, this kind of science fiction understanding. We open up one world and we kind of loop in other people to kind of join with us. And we also see, you know, I, I love fashion and maybe some of us here love fashion too, but what I love is seeing also the way racialized girls and women, and this is specifically two images of women, but this is Gabby Fresh, and um, she's talking, and she's a fat woman blogger, and she talks a lot about actually, like, how she wants to see more images of herself, and she actually, people, she actually started designing um, bikinis and did photographs in her bikini, and I thought it was amazing to see, we need to see women of size, we need to see fat women reclaiming space and saying, I love my body, I love myself, I'm going to have these pictures where it celebrates my beauty and celebrates that I too can love fashion, that I can do this. And fashion blogging, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, fashion is so frivolous, it's not feminist. Fashion is feminist. 
because it's about adornment, adornment. It can be about celebrating ourselves. It can be about creating from pieces of fabric that we can create our own magic and genius. One of the neatest um, projects that I know that's happening right now in a part of Toronto is called this project called Blossom, which is a group of young women from um, Western area who were experiencing a lot of different things in their community and were, a lot of them were racialized Muslim women and they said, you know, we want to actually do sewing classes in our in our area so that other girls can learn ways to, one, love their bodies, because a lot of the clothing is not made for our bodies, and two, that they can take control of what, what they want to wear and define how they want to be seen. And I think that's just, those kind of things are really neat. Fashion is a part of media, and fashion, how it can, how the mainstream can kind of dictate what we're supposed to look like, or who we're supposed to be, and how we can flip that and make our own media about that. Fashion blogging actually is, I think, a feminist act or it can be a feminist act of how we take it. And, you know, for, and then there's also a piece about just seeing ourselves. So I think, you know, when I started doing this work, I um, started working with young Muslim women about 10 years ago doing programming and, and you know, I'd coming into it and myself as a young woman, I didn't see a lot of visibility of us, our stories, or when we did see stories about us, it was very narrow, the definition. And, this is a piece, storytelling is an act of liberation. And when we do tell our stories and then we have control of our stories and we make the media to say those pieces, it is such a powerful moment. So here's an example of a young woman. Her name's Aisha Wahid, and I have the honor of working with her. Um, she is on the um, leadership team of Outburst, the Young Muslim Women's Project that I'm a part of. And she was featured two years ago now in um, a local Toronto newsprint paper during Pride where she wanted to speak about being a queer Muslim young woman and how she really was clear with, with the journalist. She said, you know, this is what I want to talk about. This is how I want you to quote me. And was very in control of that conversation. And that's a piece about media too. If people want to do articles about us, how do we create spaces for young racialized girls to get media training and the understanding that they have the right to say no or to their bound say no to other people's expectations and yes to their own boundaries. And I think that's a really powerful piece. And for her, she was able to define how she wanted to talk about herself. And she says here in the article, she said, there's not a lot of queer Muslim visibility. And if there's one less person hating themselves for being queer and Muslim because of seeing someone else out there, then that'd be really great. It's not that I necessarily want to be a, that role model. I just want to be like, hey, don't hate yourself. There's a community. You'll reach it eventually. And to me, that was a really powerful piece of seeing that. Oh, just gonna. And we also see that with rape culture. We're seeing young racialized women really speak out about rape culture. And we're seeing young women take up that conversation. And moving away from this kind of respect, oh yes, there's a picture of Beyonce there. Um, moving away from that idea of that we have to have these respectability politics. And there, it refers to kind of the attempts by marginalized groups to police each other. How we please each other and say that our social values are compatible with those in power, rather than challenge those in power, power for their failure to accept difference. And this was actually um, a whole concept it, it originally um, created by Evelyn Brooks Higginbottom. Um, and it was actually created in the women's movement around the, and I think that's just so neat that it was brought up in like 1890 to 1920, she talked about this in her book. And so I think that's really neat to think about the idea that this round of respectability politics has been talked about for a long time. And how, when we make media, we can challenge the idea that we have, there's a certain norm. There's a certain norm that we have to strive to be like. That actually, we shouldn't have to strive to be like a certain norm. That we actually have magic in our own bodies that we can express. That doesn't have to be the same as what's been set up by magazines or in movies or in music videos. But we actually get to define it for ourselves. And I think that goes with rape culture. And there's some amazing work being done, push back against rape culture and push back against respectability politics about telling us what kind of clothes we wear and what kind of women we can be and young girls we can be. And this is one of, I have a huge crush on this organization. I think they're amazing. They're a group of three young women, as you can see, um, from Toronto that go to a high school called Central Tech. Um, and they are a group called Project Slut. And they started doing work in their community to raise awareness around the idea of respectability politics, slut shaming, and actually victim blaming of people around the control around clothing. 
And I have a huge crush on them. I think they're amazing. And they actually said a call out. They said, hey, to all you feminists and anti-slut shamers out there and who are against rape culture and patriarchy and any misogyny, lots of hashtags. Um, we are a group of three girls from Toronto Central Tech High School, and we are currently in the process of, create, of putting together a conference of all the above hashtags. And we're wondering if there is a group of you folks who would be interested in coming or even give us your feedback on what you think would make a conference. And what I love about this is that these were girls that put this out on Tumblr and, you know, started, they said, you know, how do we start this conversation? So it was put out on Tumblr, which is a blogging site that you can use, and it's really amazing to see them kind of have that conversation with the community. We also see that they put, they made posters in the community. So this is a form of media. Poster making is a form of media. And they put this up in the bathroom. And they said, things that girls are made to feel ashamed of. Wearing clothes, wearing what makes them feel comfortable and happy. Wanting to have sex. Not wanting to have sex. Having hair on their bodies. Having periods. Putting boys in the friend zone. Wearing, not wearing makeup. Standing up against misogyny. Reporting their rape. Not appreciating catcalls. Having control of their bodies. How awesome and amazing and inspiring are these posters? Because it's this thing where they're asking, they're demanding that they have the right to be seen, heard, and believed as survivors, and also the right to exist, and that they don't have to exist in the way that other people have constructed them, but they have to exist on their own standards in their own place. And of course, we know um, Stop Women Telling Women to Smile Project, which um, I think is amazing, and another form of asking that women of, it was led by women of color, and it's a really amazing poster campaign that's done across the United States and hopefully will be done across in Canada, um, that asks the question that women don't owe you anything. They don't owe you a conversation. They don't owe you your smile. And what I love about this is it shows the diversity of women and racialized girls. And then we also see a lot of young women taking up space on YouTube. So we see young women making poetry, Eat like... The bus or just from Brave New Voices. It's a group of people across the United States, young people that create poetry and they actually do slams against poetry slams where they actually go up against different groups. Um, and so it's one example of young women taking up space, telling their stories collectively through poetry. Um, the other thing that I thought was really neat is seeing young women who are taking up space on YouTube as YouTube vloggers. And these are two young women. Um, they're originally from Toronto, but they moved to Saudi Arabia. Um, and they are doing these really neat vlogs about crafts and art. And they are, I think, 8 and 10. This is our YouTube channel, Mostly Girls. And in the upcoming videos, you will see exciting and fun videos like different hauls and nail polish tutorials and other videos like that. So I hope to see you guys in our upcoming videos. Bye, guys. Bye. Why that is important to kind of see this is that we have to see that girls are making media. They're making questions. They're asking for people to see them in all the ways that they see themselves. And making media when you work with young girls doesn't always have to be about let's let's make it about violence, let's make it about so explicitly, because actually this is about doing anti-violence work. These are young women that are recognizing that they don't see people like themselves in reflected in media, and they're taking up space, and they're developing their own sense of voice, and that's what's really important. <laughs> We also see young girls, like these tonight, you two young women, creating spaces where they're singing on YouTube, they're putting out their music, and they're, or they're doing cover versions of Beyonce, which is amazing. Um, and we're, it's, I think what's powerful for that is we're actually noticing that they have the right to take up space and they're reframing that conversation that they are want to see their voice. This is like two group um this is three young women. Um two of them are fifteen year old young women from Michigan, Detroit. Um, um and they are called We're Don't We're Muslim, Don't Panic, and they are a hip hop pop and lock group from that area, and 
I, of course, love them. But what I thought was really neat is that they were like, can we flip this narrative of oppressed Muslim women on its head and actually do dance that actually speaks to this? And so media can be created by through dance. It can be created through art forms like this to actually challenge it without saying anything but through, through our own bodies. This is a video um, from a group called Deaf Not Dumb in the UK, and what I love about it too is that there's young, young women that made a poem about their experiences as deaf young women with their families and community asking for change. And so we see media also that by deaf women that are asking for that, racialized deaf women, that are speaking to their own experiences and need for community to come in solidarity with them. In my own work, I've really been seeing it as like, how do I speak for ourselves? We see images like this of young Muslim women when they were murdered. So this is Aksa Parvez. She was murdered in 2007 by her father and brother. And I kept seeing images like this continuously emerge about racialized young women. And what I wanted to see was different images. I wanted to see images where we're actually speaking our voice and telling our own stories. And so I didn't want to see images like this. I didn't want to see what was happening in Quebec where people were making decisions about Muslim women, or I didn't want to see couscous covers of Muslim women. I wanted to see what we were talking about, and so, or Lady Gaga. And so I looked actually at this amazing um, young artist named Autumn Crossman, who's from Winnipeg, and she's now 21, but when she was younger, she made actually this amazing piece to talk about what was happening in Paris um, around the banning of hijab, hijab women that wear hijab. And so she said, hijabis in Paris, fall so hard, Scarfosi want to find me, which is obviously the Jay-Z Kanye West lyric. Um, but she used art like this to raise really important awareness, but in a humorous way. Um, and this is an image of Autumn. Autumn is a dear, a dear um, internet friend, I would say, I met her on social media. And uh, I really appreciate her work. And we actually commissioned her last year, sorry, I'll go. Uh, we commissioned her last year to create this image, which is hijabis in Quebec fall so hard, Moreau's, you want to find them. And there was such an interesting thing when we put it out to, the, to young women and girls, they were like, oh, somebody's actually noticing me, you know, noticing what I'm going through, but using art. Because it's a way to capture experience. And we had a lot of young Muslim women be a part of that conversation to create this. The other piece we see is that in our project, we do a lot of photography projects. And this is um, a piece by Fatima Wahid, and she did a three-part photo series about actually looking at how different members of her family, her grandmother, so the image on the left is her grandmother, and the middle one is her mother, and herself, how they wear their scarf and how they do their eyeliner, try to do the generational piece. And it was a beautiful piece. And what I loved about it is that she actually was able to show it at an art gallery show, and her mother came to see it. And she said to me, well, it was the first time my mom could see my art and recognize myself as an artist. And that's a piece, too. We need media, and we need media to be seen because we want to actually recognize the artist within us and recognize that we, too, have the right to have our space and our voices heard in multiple ways. And so Outburst is a, just to briefly know, Outburst is a project um, to increase the safety of young Muslim women at risk of or experiencing violence, but it's also to um, increase the leadership of young Muslim women. And a part of that has been about creating art. We create memes in our group from comments that people make. It's a very sim simple thing. You can go to actually recite this, which is a really simple method to use, and you can actually make your own um, meme, it's a meme generator with quotes. So we actually use this in a workshop where a young woman was saying, I want to say this publicly, but I don't want my name affiliated with it. So she actually made this meme with us, and it took, I think, a minute to do it. And so she says, know that I can love my family, my culture, my community, et cetera, despite the violence that might happen in it. And I think it's such a great quote, even thinking about the whole piece of barbaric cultural practices that's happening right now. And we also see media like this asking women the right to play, the right to wear, and also, um, this is um, from Tumblr, and I love Tumblr, seeing all the media that's happening on Tumblr. And this is by a woman called Little Miss Islam, and it's in the Kabi Diaries, and she says, you know, can't touch this. And we use this image a lot to talk about just the harassment that Muslim women in niqab or hijab experience. 
And this image I wanted to show is my last image about um, young Muslim women is that this is a young woman that I worked with um, who had never picked up a camera before and but wanted to do photography. And so she decided to do this photo essay about um, Somali women, and this is one of the pieces that she created. And what I loved about it is that she initially did it on her cell phone and then was able to borrow a camera to make this beautiful shot. But this is a piece about media, is that we have to create spaces also for young women to develop their tools and skills with it, and confidence, and reminding them that their voices matter in this conversation. Because we need to see images like this so we remember that we exist and that we want to hear more voices. And these are other examples of imagery. And the last piece, too, is just seeing comic books. Like, this is by Karen Campos, a Latina woman who creates comics. And what I love about this, not besides the Nicki Minaj reference, but the fact that there is a space for her to kind of speak about her own experiences. Or we see other comics by racialized women. This is a comic book that I was lucky to be a part of called Heartbeats Is It Project, which was done by South Asian young women to speak about family violence and to speak back to narrow media representations of them. And I'd just like to take attention to the girl in the middle with the orange shirt and the purple pants. We actually had worked with an amazing illustrator, Somia Singh, on this. But one of the conversations we had was we want to have rolls in the bodies. We want to have, you know, thickness to thighs. We want to have that conversation about that not all women look the same in short hair, long hair, different shades of our skin. And that was a really important piece, too, that there is diversity within racialized young girls and women. And this was a comic book created by young women about their experiences of family violence. So you see in this one, it's about a young woman who was forced into marriage, and she talks about her experience of that. And what was powerful about this is if we create our media, we're allowed to talk about the nuances and layers to it. That it's not just about, oh, I've experienced violence and that's it, or my family's bad, but the complexities with it, how much we might miss our family. What are the pieces that we want to learn from? We also see things like this about, this was done um, by another comic within the Heartbeats Project called All That I Am, where the young woman, see the rules, see the different body shape, that she wants to be able to be all that she is without judgment. And she asks them to illustrate kind of a paper doll, like different pieces of who she is. And the last um, piece that, from the comic book that I wanted to share was the one from DC Girl Diaries by a young woman named Aruba, who all of them are my heroes, um, but she made this amazing piece talking about the ways in which um, hijabi women can be, women that wear hijab can be slut shamed. And so if you look at the middle panel, you know, she's talking to a young man and then you see the young women on the other side say, oh my God, look at her tight clothes, haram, what a hijabi, why does she, why does she wear makeup, who is she trying to impress? And I think it's an important comment because it breaks open that conversation about who gets included in slut shaming. We oftentimes think, you know, it's about the mini skirts, it's about um, women who wear short outfits, but it actually can be multiple ways that slut shaming and um, victim blaming can occur. And I think it's powerful to see that kind of opened up and that conversation happen. And this is one of the young women from our project who, um, Sintori, and she takes loads of selfies. And she actually teaches me all the time that it's important to take selfies and love yourself. Um, so I have to include her image in here. Um, and this is the last piece I'll leave with you, is that when I think about media making, it is about healing. And it is about asking the questions and getting back the answers that we know that we hold inside our bodies. There's this amazing scientific um, article that came out a couple weeks ago that talked about how our cells carry our ancestors, um, can carry ancestors' stories. and and trauma, but I think it's powerful to think about that our cellular body can carry the, the ways in which our ancestors resisted and were resilient to violence, and how they healed, and how they were actually the amazing people that have made us who we are now. And so in this media that was created um, in this comic book, one of the things that we said is like, what would we want to tell ourselves, or what have we been told that actually is healing for us? And I'm going to read that to you, and then we're going to go to questions. So the young woman said things like, you know, it's not my fault. When I'm dealing with violence, it's not my fault. And that I'm making a new story, and I'm healing on my own and with others, and that I believe myself, and that ending the cycle of violence in my family makes me a good person, daughter, granddaughter, sister, cousin, niece, friend, community member. My voice matters. I have the right to be safe. And whenever I read that, I think it reminds me that my 
part and as a healing, a person that's involved in healing is also recognizing that the healer within the young woman I work with, that she has the, the word that she needs to tell herself. You know, and if it's a post-it note media making or it's a poster on their wall, if it's a song, anything that makes us feel whole and healing is important because we need to be seen and heard and believed. So I'll leave you with that. Um, and I know that our moderator is going to bring us into questions. And I know I, I shaved off a little bit of time, but hopefully we can gain that back. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Farah, for this presentation. I think you had a polling question for people. Mm -hmm. Do you want to send it out? Yes, we're going to open the poll. So I'm going to ask you, um, what what media do you make or what media do you want to make? Seeing all the different forms of media we just showed today, what kind of media do you want to make? So I would invite you to answer that question. You have three minutes. And if you have other questions, um, please ask them in the Q&A um, section. Thank you so much for those of you who are entering the media that you're making that you want to meet. Um, it's very exciting to see that. Um, Sarah, what are you reading? Well, what we're seeing, not really. So what we're seeing, so some people have not started yet. Some people are in progress. I'm just going to see the ones that are in progress. And um, well, we're seeing a couple. We're just waiting 16 more seconds. So, um, so the media that people make are things like zines, videos, and posters, spoken word, graphic novel, art, posters, effective media. Oh, I like that answer. I make effective media. Um, and one person said, I have a strong interest in writing and recently got into playwriting as well as filmmaking. I also just got into playwriting, which is very different than writing, which I'm learning. And I enjoy exploring stories about specific people and writing about their many complex lives. Graphic novels. Oh, there's people like graphic novels. We should talk. Um, so those are the people that came in through the poll. Cool. And I 
I don't see anyone having a question, but I will ask you a question. <laughs> Is that okay? <laughs> and if people have questions, you should type them right now. Otherwise, I'll... Oh, oh someone answered, um, but in another format. Um, so a spoken word theater project, and they would like to connect with other groups. So I'll be in touch with you. Um, so I guess the question, you talked a lot about um, intergenerational aspect or connection to for the for the particular communities. I think there was one quote that you used around, you know, I want to stay connected and I love people and my, my friends and my family, even though the violence that may or may not happen in those environments. Sorry mm -hmm. if I don't have the right quote, but do you would like to elaborate on that and how you see that important, especially in the work that you do? Absolutely. I think I think sometimes that when we see media stories about violence um, or any kind of violence, so be it, you know, violence that happens within our families, violence within our communities, there's kind of an assumption that there's such a vilification sometimes of our pla the places to which even where we live um, or our families. And so I think it's when that when she brought that quote up, what I loved about it was the fact that she was asking that question, well, you know, I have to when I tell a story to a, to a journalist or anyone, it, they kind of create this narrow definition, but how do we make expansive media or media that actually talks about the nuances that, yes, what's happening maybe in my community isn't okay, or what's happening in my family is not okay, but there are also things that are great about my family or great about my community, or there's things that we are resilient or resistant to violence within it, and can we celebrate those things too? And we need media that actually allows for those diversity of voices to be within it and have those kind of com complex conversations. And it's been hard, like, we definitely, right now, so our comic book project that we're doing, that Heartbeats is a project, we actually made a play out of, a theater piece out of the book, and we've been working on it for about a year, and we've been on tour with that. And it's been really interesting to see people's feedback on it, but it's been hard to kind of at one point say, you know, call out things like forced marriage and say, you know, forced marriage isn't okay, but at the same time being like, we love our families, please don't criminalize our families. And I think, you know, we see right now this barbaric cultural practices law that um, acts that has been proposed to the federal government, and that's a really great example of how there's a limited kind of conversation that happens in the media about this, how it becomes kind of like those bad immigrants or bad people. And instead, it's like, well, no, one, violence happens in all communities and culture and a global phenomenon, but it's also something that we need to have the complexity of conversation where people want to be safe, but they may not want to criminalize their families. And so when we do a disservice, when we ask, I think funders do a disservice too, when they ask us to make these like, you know, end violence posters or, or conversations, we're not allowing us to have the really com complex conversations. Because it's not just about ending violence, it's about ending poverty, it's about having community accountability circles in your family, it's about doing all these different pieces. Mm -hmm. Definitely, and something that we also see in our own work with uh, people who work with racialized girls and young women, so thank you so much. And uh, unless there's another question, I would be wrapping up. I would also invite you to continue the conversation um, online, and I'll tell you how to do that. So uh, first, thank you so much, Farah, for doing this webinar and seeing it so insightful. Um, I would also invite um, everyone who's on this webinar to follow up with some more resources that, that Girls Action has developed. So there's a research review that we worked um, on, so you have the link. Um, it's all available on our website, as well as a guide about how, you know, how people that we work with work around stepping up for racialized girls empowerment and as color communities or words. And it really emphasizes the importance of working like inter in like in ways that are intergenerational, but also um, make sense for people in, in their own community. Can I have one more thing? Yeah, go ahead. One of the things that I really was struggling with with this was how that oftentimes racialized girls aren't just racialized girls that there's multiple identities for us. So it's really important. I know Audre Lorde says, like, there's no single issue because we don't leave single issue lies. Um, and I'm paraphrasing. But I think with this is if you're working with racialized young women, it's always us remembering the multiplicity of identities we have within us. So it could be queer. It can be, you know, we could be deaf women. We can be multiple things. And really recognizing that when we do create media, not to create such a, like we're gonna talk just about this one part of us, so the racialized piece, we can't leave all the other identities or social locations at the door. And I think there's some really neat ways to do that, but really being responsible 
really, as I, I'm assuming that most people on this are people who work with racialized girls um, and young women. So it's just thinking about how our responsibility is to that and also thinking about how our responsibility is around stories. So when we did the comic book, um, we've had a lot of people interested in doing their own comic books, but my thing back to it is that we had counselors in the space with the young women at all times. We made sure that they had support. We made sure that they were paid to do their work. We made sure that that was responsible pay. We also gave them a lot of training and work with elders and also made a space to say to them, you name what you want to say in your story and what you don't want to name. Because you have the right to say how your story will go and how you will shape your story instead of other people speaking on your behalf. And the salacious details don't need to be included. Because there's such an interest in, in kind of laying bare our communities to tell our salacious details of, of who and what we are. But actually it's important to kind of create space for us to name how we want to share our stories. And that story might be about the story of resistance and resiliency, or it might be of how we feel hurt or harmed, but we get to define that. And I think that's what's powerful about us making our own media. Exactly. And one of the resources that's linked to that that I didn't include is a zine called Thriving that was made by a racialized or young woman or however it identified. And some of the stories are very interesting because they talk about gender. They also talked about sexual orientation, about disability and other statuses and other ways that was significant for the people who, do, who did participate in that zine. Um, and that's something to really think about when we work in something that um, we strongly believe in. Um, and then if you want more information, you can always visit our website. You can participate in more webinars. Um, you can continue the conversation online. So we have a Facebook account. Um, where there's a Facebook event actually for this webinar. There's also Twitter. Um, you have Farah's Endo, and you also have Haas that's here, um, underscore girls action, and Farah's Farah underscore can. Um, and I would really invite you to continue the conversation. Um, you know, we can continue and see, like, and share resources. Maybe there are other things that you're thinking of, um, and it'd be lovely to hear about. Um, and for everyone, you will get a link to the full presentation and the question period, like, um, that's recording in the next couple of days. So look for it. Um, if not, you can always, you know, check our YouTube channels. It will be there soon. Um, maybe next week that will be there. We also would really like to remind you that we will be asking for your feedback on today's presentation. Um, some of you wrote some of your feedback, but it's really great that you put it in, in the pop-up window that will appear um, with a very short survey um, because that makes us able to improve them every time. Um, so in order to find more on the topic, I would invite you to ask us your questions. If you have other questions, um, go online and ask them. And if you want to connect with me, you can always email me at Karin, that's K-R-I-N-E, at girlsactionfoundation.ca. And like you see on the screen, um, I coordinate two working groups, one about people who work with newcomer girls and young women and work with racialized girls and young women. And like Farah said, it's not only those identities, but it's also like the primary identity of people that um, work with. Um, and you can also contact Jillian Kilfoyle um, if you're interested, you know, you're in a rural or isolated area or you work with indigenous girls and young women mostly. Um, if you're thinking that that would be something I would love, please contact us and we'll be really, really happy to be there. And again, thank you so much for taking part in this webinar um, and for taking time of your busy day to be with us. We really appreciate it. And thank you so much, Farah, again, for um, hosting and presenting this really fabulous Prezi. And we hope that you have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.